Well, I want to start our teaching time. If you would open up your Bibles to Matthew, it's the first book of the New Testament. If you've got one of our free Bibles, uh, we've got free Bibles always available in the back here in the auditorium. I'm going to be reading from one of our free Bibles. It's specifically, it's the New Living Translation. It's a very uh, easy to read uh, compared to some of the other translations of the scripture. I'm on page 792. If you've got one of those, I'm cheating. I'm helping you out a little bit. Um, Matthew chapter 22. I want to start today and read starting in verse 36. It says, teacher, which is the most important commandment in the law of Moses? This is the Old Testament law. The question was raised. What's the most important commandment? Jesus replied, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. The second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. The entire law and all the demands of the prophets are based on these two commandments. So two commandments, we can even simplify it a little bit. Love God, love people. Two clear commandments from Jesus. But if love for God is the first commandment and love other people is the second, then clearly love is not an emotion. Because you can't command a feeling, can you? Anybody tried that? <laughs> you can't command an emotion. Um, earlier in Matthew chapter 5, for example, this same book, Jesus gets a little more radical than that, and he commands all of us to love our enemies. Okay, are we really supposed to have warm, fuzzy feelings about Adolf Hitler or Osama bin Laden? Are, are we really supposed to have warm, fuzzy feelings for that guy at work who's always undermining us to the boss or that kid at school who keeps spreading false truths, some rumors about us? Are we really supposed to feel this love toward that person? Well, clearly, clearly no. God isn't telling us how to feel. God's telling us how to act. Look with me at the most famous passage about love. If we turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 13, it's on page 925 in the Free Bible. I read this passage uh, at a wedding that I officiated last week. And if you've been to weddings over the years, you've heard this passage read. This is the most famous part of the Bible about love. Specifically, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 4. The author says, love is patient and kind. Just stop right there. Love is patient. Well, patience, the more I think about this, this is the opposite of emotion, right? Patience is the opposite of emotion. Theologian Lyman Abbott defined patience as passion tamed. I love that. I resonate with that because it's the opposite of emotion. Patience is passion tamed. When I'm impatient, I don't know what it looks like for you. When I lose my patience, you know what I'm filled with? Emotion. <laughs> I'm angry. I'm upset. I'm frustrated, maybe even scared of something. When I'm patient, the, the rare moments when I'm filled with patience, my emotions are in check because the Bible says that love is patient. It's not a feeling. And we just read it. The Bible says love is kind. Love is patient and kind, 1 Corinthians 13, 4. How do you feel today? Oh, I feel really kind. Thank you. Nobody says that, right? Because kindness is not a feeling. Kindness is something we do. You get where I'm going here. If, if love is more about what we do and less about how we feel, then most of our cultural conclusions, as we watch movies and read books and talk with each other, most of our cultural conclusions about love are wrong. They're flat out wrong. We can't fall into it or out of it. We can fall into or out of a feeling, right? But we can't stumble into or spill out of love. We may choose to start or stop behaving in loving ways towards a person, sure, definitely, but we actually have full control over that. And if we apply this understanding of love to our relationships, to family, to friendships, to boyfriend, girlfriend, spouses, we all of a sudden discover we have a lot of leverage where we didn't think that we did. So let's get really real for a moment. Some of us here today, maybe, 
don't feel like being married any longer. The feelings we once had for our spouses, the desire, the affection, the quickened heart rate, the sexual attraction, they've been dulled maybe by just passing years, maybe by routines or unresolved conflict for sure, or maybe just our laziness. And since we don't feel any of these positive emotions, we've concluded, maybe some of us, that this marriage is not worth working on. So some of us are thinking about ending it. We don't love each other anymore, we say. But do you know what we're really admitting when we say that? Husbands, if you say, I, I just don't think I love my wife anymore, what, we're, what you're really admitting, husbands, is I, I am not acting in a loving way toward my wife anymore. Wives, same thing. When you're, when you're saying, I don't think I love my husband anymore, you're saying, I've stopped loving in, in behaving in loving ways towards my husband. Remember that old Righteous Brothers song? I always think of Top Gun. I'm dating myself here, I know. Um, you've lost that loving feeling. Whoa, that loving feeling. I'm not going to sing it. You've lost that loving feeling. Now it's gone, gone, gone. Well, what if I told you today that you could get it back? I'm serious. We, we have to get this ridiculous idea of love being a feeling out of our heads. That's not what it is. Love is not a feeling. It is focused action. It is the thing we do, not the emotions that drive what we do. I like how author Stephen Covey puts it. He says it really well. He says, love is a verb. Love is something you do, the sacrifices you make, the giving of self. If you want to study love, study those who sacrifice for others. Love, the feeling, is a fruit of love, the verb. I think he just nails it. I love how he says that. If you want to study love, study those who sacrifice for others. Bing, 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 bing. That's why we look at Jesus. Reason number 242, we should look really hard at Jesus because nobody sacrificed more for others than Jesus. Who better to emulate? Who better to follow? Who better to submit control of our lives to than the one who showed us what ultimate love is? How do you and I love the people around us like Jesus does? That's the question of the day. How do you and I love the people around us like Jesus does? Not like the people around us. Thank God he doesn't ask us, he doesn't command us to like all the people around us. We don't even all like each other in this room, right? He does command us to love everybody. So here's the question for today and for the series moving forward over the next few weeks. How do we love people well, like Jesus? I found an absolutely fascinating doctoral thesis. And I know that that's hilarious because it's like an oxymoron, right? A fascinating doctoral thesis. But stay with me. I don't sit around and read these for fun, okay? I just stumbled across it. It's fascinating. It was called Blessers versus Converters. That was the title of the study. Blessers versus Converters. The study was based on two teams of missionaries that both went to Thailand, to the Far East. But they went to Thailand with two very, very different strategies, okay? The first team, they were called the converters, and they went with the sole intention of converting people, of evangelizing people, of, of helping people become Christians, become followers of Jesus. This is right out of the Bible. This is what we're commanded to do, to tell the world about Jesus. Their mission was to convert. The second team that went to Thailand at the same time was called the Blessers, and they went with the intention of blessing people. They would say, I'm just here to bless whoever comes my way, or I just want to be a blessing to the people in my community. I just want to add to the economy, the society, the culture, the community. And the study followed these two teams for two years. And here's what they discovered. This is, this is pretty cool. First of all, not a shocker, they discovered that the blessers had a greater social impact than the converters. That's not surprising. That's why they went, right? This proved out that the team's intention of, of blessing people and the community around them, and they saw more social betterment, more social good. Here's the shocker. The study also found 
that the team of blessers had 48 times as many conversions as the converters. You catching that? 48 times more people came to know Jesus and trust Jesus and follow Jesus through the efforts of the blessers than did the converters. Bottom line here, the best way to love people well is to be a blesser. The best people to love, the best way to love people well, like Jesus did, is to be a blesser. So how do you and I love the people around us? Well, like Jesus does, we bless. We bless. And a spoiler alert, that B word, if, if I have my way, and Jordan's going to help out with this in the coming weeks in our teaching series as well, this B word, bless, is going to get etched in your brains. It's going to be a part of our colonial conversation. To love well, if you're taking notes on the back of the handout or you're using the app on your thumbs, this is where I want you to start your notes. To love well, to love like Jesus does, is to be a blessing. To love well, to love like Jesus does, is to be a blessing. And by the way, this should surprise us zero. If we go to the beginning of the book, if we go to Genesis, we will see that God's method, his strategy to change the world from the beginning, it's been a blessing strategy. Turn with me to Genesis chapter 12. I'm not going to tell you what page number this is because it's the beginning. It's the first book. Genesis chapter 12, starting in verse 2. This is God talking to Abraham, kind of the, the father of Judaism. God said, I will bless you and make you famous, and you will be a blessing to others. I will bless those who bless you and curse those who treat you with contempt. All the families on earth will be blessed through you. So God blessed Abraham. We read the history. God blessed him uh, relationally. God blessed him financially. God blessed him spiritually. But it, did you catch this? It wasn't just so Abraham would be really blessed. It wasn't just so Abraham could just receive all this wonderful stuff. No, it was so that Abraham could in turn be a blessing to the whole world across time. And this blessing strategy continued all the way through history, all the way through Jesus, it's what he did, all the way to now, to what you and I are called to do. So I think it's really important. we got to stop for a second because if, if we don't grab a hold of this truth, uh, I'm, I'm terribly convinced of this. If you don't grab a hold of this truth I'm about to lay on you, you're, you're going to miss out on the life Jesus invites you into. You're certainly not going to be able to be a blessing to other people. And, and frankly, nothing in the next few weeks we talk about is going to make sense. And it's this simple truth. Every good thing in your life, everything you can think about that you're grateful for, big and small, every blessing you receive, it's not just for you. It's not just for you. You are blessed to be a blessing. I am blessed so richly to be a blessing. This is the life that Jesus invites all of us into. This is the life that we're called to live out. So what does it look like to do that? What does it look like to bless people, to be a blesser? That's a great question. I'm so glad you asked. To answer that question, today I want to give you five purposeful practices that we're going we're to lean into as a church we're going to do this individually, I hope. We're certainly going to do it all together. We're going to lean to these five practices. And before we get into what they are, I got to tell you, I'm not a big fan of, you know, three ways to get your best life now. Like, to me, that's so trite and hallmarky, and I, I just, that's not life-changing, okay? I'm not a big fan of acronyms. I have way too many acronyms in my life already. But this is gold, I'm telling you. And it's not because it's from me. It's because it's from Jesus, okay? Uh, Dave Ferguson is a pastor in Chicago who looked at the scriptures and kind of unpacked this a little bit. And I'm totally ripping off this acronym from him because it just resonates so deeply with me. This is what it means to live the Christian life, to be a blesser. We're going to look at five practices. We're going to use this acronym of this word, BLESS, B-L-E-S-S. -S. Now, before I, I share the first one with you, let me just say that for some of you, it's going to be incredibly tempting for you to go through and just do them and check the box, okay? It's a linear progression of practices. We're going to do them in order. Uh, and some of you are just high achievers. Some of you just love lists. You love checking them off. And you're going to fly through it. You're going to be, bam, done. Woo, I did it. And you will have missed the point, 
<laughs> because you will then have made it about you and what you just pulled off, which is so ironic, right? This is about blessing other people. Another temptation for some of you is you're going to look at this when we share this in just a minute, and you're going to go, that's too simple. It's got to be harder than that. It's got to be more complicated than that. And you're going to blow it off just because it's so simple. And I'm just going to tell you, this is what Jesus did. You're, you're, you're going to really like this, I think. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to look through these next few weeks. Three weeks, uh, we're going to be exploring the blessed practices. I'm going, to, I'm going to rattle them off today. This is kind of an introductory message as we're going to unpack them more in the coming weeks. The B that we do first is we begin with prayer. We begin with prayer. We don't just get crazy busy. We just don't just go tackle the, the, the task at hand. We start by seeking the Father. We begin with prayer. Then we listen really well, which most of us really don't do well. Am I right? Um, when I'm listening, I'm usually, uh, can I just be real? When I'm listening to you talk, sometimes I'm just waiting until you're done so I can start talking. Anybody with me? No? We've got to listen really well. Then we've got to, this is my favorite, the E stands for eat together. It's my favorite practice. This is what you learned at church today. We've got to eat together more often. We've got to drink together more often. We've got to spend time with each other. This is what Jesus did. The first S, after we've prayed, we've sought direction from God, we've listened really well to the people around us, we've spent time with them, we know their needs. We serve and we respond. The S is we serve and we respond. We serve the people around us. And then notice what's purposefully last, the last S, as we share our story. We share my story and God's story and how they have intersected. We use words on purpose. Now, as we consider each of these simple practices together, oh, my hope for you individually, my hope for us as a church is that we'll get this, we'll embrace that this is the life God invites us into. Christianity is not just about going to church on a Sunday morning. Christianity is about being blessers to the people around us. It's sharing God's love and his joy with the people around us. It's sharing it. And, and I know that most of you are not sharing the good news of Jesus with people. You know how I know that? I'm making a little bit of assumption. I just read a different study that reveals that to us. I read a recent study where researchers asked Protestant churchgoers, so that's just non-Catholic uh, churchgoers, Baptists and Methodists and Presbyterians and non-denominational folks. They, they researched this. They asked a bunch of these churchgoers about their thoughts and behaviors pertaining to sharing their faith. And this is what they found. 56 56 percent of respondents, so a little more than half of respondents, said they pray for opportunities to share the gospel with non-Christians. So, so most prayed, but also just more than half, 55 percent, said they have not engaged in a gospel-centered conversation in at least six months. So if this study is at all true for us here at Colonial, most of us want to share the good news of Jesus with people. Most of us want people to know how great God is, the difference Jesus has made in our lives, the forgiveness we've tasted, the life he's invited us into. Most of us want to share, but most of us aren't talking about him. Most of us aren't purposefully sharing the good news of Jesus with the people around us. Now, why is that? Um, you could answer that for you. I could answer that for me. I I'm guessing for most of us, there's a few reasons we, we fear rejection. I mean, who wants rejection in a conversation, in a relationship, right? Um, I think a lot of us, we, we dread awkward conversations. There's a lot of awkwardness when we're talking to people who maybe have a different worldview or they just have different opinions or convictions. Uh, some of us have a high level of anxiety. What if they ask me some questions that I don't know the answers to? Understandable. Some of us... I think just feel so busy and we procrastinate and we think we're going to do that because it matters, but we, we just keep pushing it off. I think some of us just worry that we don't have what it takes. We can't articulate what we believe very well. We, we don't have the confidence. I think maybe even some of us hang around Christians too much and we don't even have people in our lives who are not Christians that we can share the good news of Jesus with. I know that's not true for a lot of us, but some of us, I don't know which of those those reasons for not sharing our faith, you can resonate with. But if any of them do, you're going to love these simple 
bless practices because they're clear, they're doable, totally doable, and most importantly, it's exactly what Jesus did. It's exactly what Jesus did. Jesus did not call us to stand on a street corner like a weird preacher and yell, you're all going to hell. Thankfully, that's not the call, the invitation for us to embrace. He called us to love people really well, just like he did. So let's quickly tackle the first practice today. We're just going to tackle the B with a few minutes we have left. The B is begin with prayer. Now, why? Why start with prayer? Well, it's because of what Jesus did. I say we do what Jesus did. Jesus started with prayer. This is how Jesus loved well. In fact, uh, when he finally went public, Jesus lived his life in the flesh here, God in the flesh, when he finally decided, okay, the time, it's right, let's do it now. He hadn't done a single miracle yet. He hadn't preached a single sermon yet. He hadn't sat down one-on-one and talked to someone about God the Father yet. He hadn't done any of that. He hadn't revealed to the world who he was. The first thing he did is he began with prayer. If we read in Luke chapter 4, verse 1, if I can find it in my Bible. i got too many things marked here. Here we go. Jesus, for chapter 4, verse 1 of Luke, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan River, and he was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. So Jesus went off into the desert, the wilderness, to pray, to fast, to actually encounter the evil one. He began his mission, his mission to love really well, he began it with prayer. In fact, if we turn just a couple chapters later in Luke chapter 6, this is what he did before he drafted his first team to work with, his first disciples. Luke chapter 6, verse 12. One day soon afterward, Jesus went up on a mountain to pray, and he prayed to God all night, all night long. At daybreak... He called together all of his disciples and chose 12 of them to be apostles. Here are their names. Simon, whom he named Peter, Andrew, Peter's brother, James, John, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, son of Alphaeus, Simon, who was called the Zealot, Judas, son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who later betrayed him. Now, if that had been me, and I was about to start my mission to love people really well, I think I would have been tempted to skip the prayer part. Uh, definitely skip the pray all night part. And I would have just looked around and looked for the best leaders. Who is the best? Who's the top first round draft picks in this crowd? I want that guy. He's tall. He's muscular. He's good looking. That's what I would have done, right? Well, Jesus is God in the flesh. He doesn't operate by the same operating system we do. He doesn't think that way. He picked the 12 that he wanted to pick. I believe after listening to God the Father. The stakes were high. This is the team I'm going to change the world with, Jesus was thinking. Now, some of you are probably stuck for a second thinking, okay, Jesus was God in the flesh. Why did Jesus have to pray to God the Father? That's kind of weird. Well, I took another great question. You guys have lots of great questions today. Um, Even though Jesus was God in the flesh, to become fully human meant he had to to self-impose limitations on himself. I don't think we think about this much. I mean, because God became fully human in the form of Jesus, Jesus had to sleep and eat to refuel. Jesus had to use the restroom. Jesus had a cut that had to heal. I, I, I don't think we have wrapped our brains around, most of us have wrapped our brains around how really human God chose to become. So even as God the Son in the flesh, Jesus depended on God the Father for direction. I love, you read, you read the life of Jesus, he is constantly praying. He's constantly going aside into the desert, up on the mountaintop, getting up early in the morning before, before everybody else to pray, to, to talk to God the Father. Even in the middle of interactions with other humans all around him, he's just pausing and saying, Father, what do you want me to do here? He's constantly doing this. He models it for us. He began with prayer. Now, I don't know what happened that night. He stayed up all night praying. I don't know if he heard God the Father talk in an audible voice. I don't know if he had these names popping into his mind, and he was wondering, like we do, is that indigestion? Is that God talking to me? I don't know what that looked like, but we do know that Jesus came out and picked his first 12 And he picked people that we wouldn't have picked. He picked common fishermen and corrupt 
tax collectors and, and political revolutionaries, violent political revolutionaries, and, and a bunch of nobodies. We, we, they're not nobodies to us now because we look back in history, but back then they were nobody. People walked right by these guys. Jesus began with prayer, and different things happened. So when you and I do what Jesus did, when we begin with prayer, it's so that we love well. We begin with prayer so that we love well. If we're going to do this right, if we're going to do this really well, we're going to begin with prayer. And don't miss this, if we begin with prayer so that we discover who he wants us to love well. It may not be the same people you're thinking right now. It may not be the people that just come to mind. We seek direction from God. Who do you want me to bless today? Who do you want me to be a blessing to this week? We seek direction from God the Father. So I want to get practical. I want to close out our time today, today and get really practical with you. I want you to make a list. Some of you are big on lists. Some of you hate lists. We're all, I hope, going to make a short list. Um, things get done when we get focused and intentional. List making is very helpful. It's helpful in all walks of life. Um, for us, it can help focus our attention on those that we hope to love well, those that we hope, 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 hope discover life in Jesus. So three quick thoughts about a list I want you to make, okay? So if you're not already there, get the back of the handout or get your app ready. We're going to make a list, all right? Start with those in your sphere of influence. Think about your sphere of influence, your family, your friends, the people you work with, the people you went to school with up until last week, the neighbors you live among, the casual acquaintances you see every day because you go to the same coffee shop or convenience store or gym or whatever that is. That's your sphere of influence. That's different than their sphere of influence. That's different than his or her sphere of influence. We all have a different sphere of influence. Start with your sphere of influence. Secondly, focus your efforts by investing in three people. I want us to get really practical and strategic this month. Let's not think about 50 people. We could probably make a difference and bless their lives. Think about three. Maybe only one person at first comes to mind as you pray and as you, as you, as you ponder. But, but think about three. Three people you're going to intentionally bless. Now, I would suggest you give priority to people who don't attend church, uh, who, as far as you know, don't know Jesus yet. Let's be a blessing to people like that. Or maybe they're people who do go to a church. Maybe they go to another church. Maybe they even come to Colonial. But as far as you know, it's more of just a religious habit, a family habit. You don't know if they really have discovered forgiveness and grace and the love and purpose of life in Jesus. Think of those people. I would also say if you're married, not a bad idea, husbands and wives, to make a list together. Just work on it as a couple over the next few weeks. Um, there's no right or wrong way to do this, but just a suggestion. So start with your sphere of influence, focus on three people, and then pray for your list every single day. Every single day. I want you to put these three names on the mirror in your bathroom, on the dash of your car, on the lock screen on your phone, what, what, all these different ways you can just keep those names in front of you, that you will be reminded just to ask God the Father to reveal opportunities, to reveal ways that you can listen well, you can eat with them, drink with them, spend time with them, that you can meet their needs and maybe even find an opportunity to share your story. I would say this too, maybe one or more of those three names, maybe it's still a blank, whether it's right now or you're looking at it tonight before you go to bed, I got, I got, I got three blanks or I got one of these that's still a blank. That's why we begin with prayer. Maybe, maybe this whole week is just you asking, God, who do you want me to bless? I'm wide open. Who do you want me to be intentional with to be a blessing? 